All right, so we want to, um, again, uh, thank everyone for showing up to our seminar uh, this afternoon. Um, as we were saying earlier, offline, um, tomorrow, I guess, is the official start of uh, spring break, but some students are already on their way out of um, campus. And in fact, the person who is gonna be my co-host today is actually traveling in a minivan through Utah. <laughs> she is in my class, Gia Irazo. She's originally from Keene, Texas, went to Keene High School. Um, she is a psychology pre-med major, a junior. Um, Career-wise, she's looking at becoming a pediatric psychiatrist. I think she'd be a very good one. I saw her telling stories to kids and stuff. She really makes a good connection with them. Um, what I find fascinating here, and I did not know, is that you're a poetry director for Macarios. What's up with the, the Spanish ministries? Do the um, the Spanish is... ministry. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> I do spoken word poetry and I write spoken word poetry, um, just for around campus, the different ministries around campus, um, and the different churches on campus, but also in Macarios for um, we like travel around to churches and we put on the program. So I'll make poems and I have like a team that I teach basically how to do spoken word wow um so i guess um when you get back from spring break we need to talk i didn't know that skill of yours that skill set anyway you uh i'm just a uh, jack of all trades yes <laughs> you are our co-host for today so it's your turn to introduce our speaker Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, well, I would now like to just give a very warm welcome to Dr. Neil Mesa. Um, he gained his PhD in molecular biology at the University of Cambridge in UK. Before studying theology and ethics in Cambridge and at King's College in London, he taught theology in Oxford, Birmingham and at the University of Wales before moving in 2009 to the University of Winchester, where he is currently the professor of theology. His research in much of his teachings are focused on the intersections of theology and ethics with the biosciences and healthcare. So how they kind of all fit together. His publications include Flourishing Health, Disease and Bioethics and Theological Perspective, Theological Neuroethics, Christian Ethics Meets the Science of the Human Brain, and Science and Theology, Encounters Between Science and the Christian Tradition. Um, I had the honor of being able to like go through, you can look these up and just like read kind of what they're about. And they're just very interesting if you guys like the brain, how the brain fits into um, theology, how the brain fits into God. Um, so yeah, I would really urge you guys to check those out. Uh, he is also an ordained minister of the United Reformed Church in the UK. So, yes, so excited to hear him talk today. And I'm so blessed to have had the opportunity to introduce such an amazing person. So thank you, Dr. Messler. Can't wait to hear what you Well, thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, Gia, uh, for, for that introduction. And, and um, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. It's a, a real pleasure to be uh, to, to be with you. And um uh, good evening from from Winchester uh, in the UK, where it's um, uh, it's um, about eight eight thirty seven pm. Um, also, so so I'm I'm four hours ahead of most of you at the moment. I think. Um, so just bear with me while I share my PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> okay. So can everyone see that? Okay. Good. So, as you see from the title slide, I, I've tweaked slightly the title um, that I, um, I I supplied for the program. So, my title is Neuroscience, 
theology and ethics. So, um, as you heard from Gia uh, um, in introducing me, I um, I have uh, a research background in the biological sciences. Um, I, I um, started out um, an academic career with a PhD in molecular biology, um, but then um, a, a call to ordained ministry led me out of molecular biology and into theological studies. And as a result of that kind of um, uh, academic journey I, uh, um, I, and, and, and vocational journey, I, I got interested in the, um, the areas where um, my um, scientific research background um, and also by extension um, medicine and healthcare um, interact or intersect or maybe sometimes collide with um, theology and ethics. So most of my research and a lot of my teaching during my academic career has been uh, concerned with these questions that arise at the intersections of, of theology and ethics with um, the biosciences and healthcare. So much of that um, has been concerned with, with, with a whole range of issues and questions in bioethics. Um, I've also done some work and, and I've, I've um, written and published um, uh, to some extent on, on the, um, uh, the relationship or, or, or the interaction between science and theology, um, the, the science and faith field, if you like. And quite a lot of the work that I do combines both of these um, fields or aspects of both of these fields. So, so it um, draws together um, science, theology and ethics in various ways. And that's true of my, um, my, my main current um, area of research interest, which is, um, which is concerned with the, um, the, the interactions or intersections of neuroscience, theology and ethics. Uh, and that's what I um, want to be um, uh, talking about and, and discussing with you. Um, during this uh, during this seminar, um, so I'll focus on two aspects of this um, this kind of three way interaction. Um, first of all, I want to say a little bit about the, um, the, the about the neuroscience and also the cognitive science of religion and um, the the theological significance of that field of scientific study, and then I'll move on from that to um, uh, to, to say a little bit about um, one issue um, that arises in the fields known as neuroethics, a field that encompasses quite a wide range of, of um, both theoretical and practical ethical questions raised by, by current and emerging neuroscience. So within that field of neuroethics, um, I want to say a little bit about um, ethical questions that are raised by um, what's sometimes known as neuroscience-based mind reading and sometimes known as brain reading. So that will be the second part of the talk. So to start though with um, the neuroscience and the cognitive science of religion. Um, whoops, uh, that wasn't meant to happen. Um, so, if we're talking about the neuroscience and the cognitive science of religion, um, there are various um, kinds of scientific study that come into the picture here. So for quite a number of years, neuroscientists have been interested in what's going on in the brain um, when uh, people form religious beliefs or have religious experiences or engage in religious practices. And sometimes that's, um, and that neuroscientific interest in religion has, um, has mostly been about investigating the, the neural correlates of religious experience or practice. Um, when people are reporting religious experiences or engaging in religious practices like, like prayer, what's, what's going on in, in the brain? What kinds of, what forms of brain activity um, are correlated with, with, with those experiences or practices? And this, um, this area of, of, of study, as I've said, goes back um, 
really um, uh, many years. Um, and so one early and um, uh, quite controversial, still controversial um, example of this, this, this field of study was um, that back in the 1980s, the, um, the, the neuroscientist um, Michael Persinger um, hypothesized that um, religious experiences were, um, were, were generated by activity in the temporal lobes. And he claimed that he could induce religious experiences by stimulating the, um, uh, the temporal lobes of, of um, research participants, research, research subjects, using a device that he, um, I, th I think he and certainly others came to nickname the, the, the God Helmet. It has to be said that um, his research, as I've said, has proved controversial. Um, uh, other groups have tried and failed to replicate it, and, and it's, been, um, it's been argued that um, and that the results he um, he claims were um, uh, uh, likely caused more by his participants' suggestibility than by any actual um, activity that he succeeded in inducing in, in the temporal lobes. But nonetheless, that, that's that's an early example of of a claim about um, neural correlates of, of religious experience. Um, uh, and uh, neuroscientific attempts to to study and even manipulate those. Um, more recently, um, the neuroscientists um, uh, Mario Beauregard and Vincent Paquet um, uh, investigated the um, neural correlates of um, uh, mystical experiences in, um, in, a, in in a group of nuns who belonged to the um, the, the Carmelite order within Roman Catholicism. Uh, they, they found very different um, results from, from, from those person who had, had, had claimed um, that they, um, they were able to, to study by um, uh, electroencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging um, uh, uh, aspects of brain activity um, in this group of nuns while they were either recalling or even actually experiencing mystical experiences. And Beauregard and Paquet um, uh, um, found that these experiences were correlated with um, neural activity in a wide, wide variety, wide range of centers in the brain. There was no one God spot or God location in the brain um, in, in, in there. Um, in, in, in their findings. Um, more recently still, the, um, the Scandinavian uh, neuroscientist Uffe Schert has uh, done various studies um, uh, uh, using again um, fMRI, um, I think, to, 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 to study the brain activity uh, of um, participants engaging in, in um, what you might call everyday religious practices such as prayer. And his, um, uh, his hypothesis really is that um, the, the centers of the brain that are, um, that are active when people are engaging in um, the regular day-by-day -day, um, practices such as prayer are um, to a very large extent, the same um, regions and centers of the, the regions and areas of the brain that would be active in normal interpersonal interaction between humans. Um, and and his, um, his, one of his major claims is, is, is that um, there are no kind of special mechanisms or centers in the brain that, 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 that generate religious activity or religious experience. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the brain activity that correlates with, 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 with um, religious practice and experience is, is very similar to the, the, the brain activity that, that's, that would be associated with, with um, uh, our everyday interpersonal interactions. So you have these studies of um, uh, new, the neural correlates of religious experience and practice. Some neuroscientists have wanted to go further um, and develop um, 
neuroscientific models or theories of, of religious experience and belief. So back in the 1990s, the, the, the neuroscientists Eugene Daquili and Andrew Newberg um, developed what they called neurotheology on the back of quite a complex um, neurobiological model of how they believed certain um, kinds of, of, um, uh, of um, religious or, or mystical experience were generated by the brain. They, they, um, um, they, they were very insistent, incidentally, that, 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 that um, talking about how the brain generates religious or mystical experience was, was, was not, in their view, a, a, a reductionist kind of um, uh, set of claims. Um, they, um, they said it's perfectly possible to, to, to um, uh, see these experiences as really real, um, but mediated through, through brain activity. And, and they produced this, this complex model um, of, for how that might, um, might take place. More recently, Patrick McNamara has produced a very different um, model of religious experience, um, which is understood, which he understands primarily as um, a, a form of self-transformation or self-transcendence. And um, he has a, a model of how the, the executive functions of the brain um, uh, are um, recruited to, to um, to, you know, to bring about this kind of self-transformation. So that's um, a kind of brief survey of, of some of the things that neuroscientists have been interested in, do, in, in doing, in, 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 in studying religion neuroscientifically. And I want to set alongside that the, the, um, the field known as the cognitive science of religion, um, which, um, which is an interdisciplinary field, but um, uh, operates more in the territory of cognitive psychology than neuroscience. Um, and works with the basic assumption that um, aspects of mental function, um, um, mental functions or mental devices as, 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 as um, cognitive scientists of religion some, sometimes um, uh, speak of them. Um, different, um, different functions of the human mind um, uh, might interact with one another to, um, to give rise to various kinds of religious belief or experience. Um, so one example of this um, uh, that a lot of cognitive scientists of religion talk about is, is what, um, uh, what Justin Barrett I think originally um, uh, uh, described as a, a hypersensitive agency detection device. The, the idea is that we, ha we have a kind of mental function, um, a, a kind of cognitive function or a mental device that, that, that um, leads our minds to infer that, that events in, in, in the outside world are, are often caused by, um, by agents somewhat like ourselves. Um, but that, um, that, that kind of mental function, according to CR, CSR scholars, um, uh, is, is um, inclined to be oversensitive rather than undersensitive. In other words, we're, 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 um, we're more inclined to um, uh, misinterpret sort of random events in the world as the actions of agents than um, uh, to, 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 to misattribute um, uh, actual agents' actions to, to um, random ha happenings, ran random physical events, if that makes sense. So um, according to CSR scholars like Barrett, um, mental devices like these, like the, the hypersensitive agency detection device and, and, and others, um, interact with one another. And out of those interactions, uh, um, belief, our beliefs in supernatural agents um, in, in, including uh, um, beliefs in God um, uh, and um, religious experiences can arise. So that's um, a, a very quick thumbnail sketch of some of what goes on um, in the neuroscience and the cognitive science of religion. So my question then is what Christian believers and Christian theologians ought to make of all that. 
And in particular, as, as, I've, um, uh, as I've put it on this slide, what, if anything, should, um, uh, should Christians or might Christians learn from either the neuroscience or the cognitive science of religion? Should Christian believers learn from these scientific studies of, of, of religion that they need to abandon their faith? Um, should they conclude that these scientific studies, the, 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 these neuroscientific and, and cognitive science studies have generated convincing explanations, naturalistic explanations for, for religious belief and experience. We know how the brain and the mind generate religious beliefs and experiences, and therefore we don't need to, um, uh, we, we don't need to posit that those, um, those beliefs and experiences um, have any, uh, in, any real connection to a real um, transcendent, um, uh, yeah, a, a transcendent supernatural reality. Um, is that something that, that Christian believers should, should conclude, that um, neuroscience and cognitive science religion um, explain away their faith and therefore they need to abandon it? Well, anyone who, um, who came to that conclusion in the, the, the kind of crude way that I've, I've just stated it would be committing some kind of genetic fallacy, some kind of logical fallacy that, um, uh, that, that, that you know, mistakenly, um, uh, mistakenly believes uh, or, 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 or that, 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 that consists of a mistaken belief that to explain something is to explain it away. Um, and pretty much everyone um, uh, involved in, in, in these discussions, whatever their own um, uh, religious um, or non-religious stance, would, would acknowledge that. Um, so the, um, the psychologist Paul Bloom, for example, um, is, is quite clear about this in, in, in some of his, his writing about CSR and, and, and uh, religious belief. Um, he says there are people who um, there are psychologists who study the, the, the psychological mechanisms that lead people to claim there's life on Mars. But those psychologists would be very confused if, um, if, if they thought that their psychological investigations had any bearing on, 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 um, on the question of whether there really is life on Mars. And, and similarly, um, he's, he's quite clear um, that um, investigations of the neuroscientific um, bases or, or, or correlates of religious belief or, 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 or the cognitive mechanisms that generate religious beliefs um, doesn't tell you anything about the truth or, or, or otherwise, of, or, or doesn't, doesn't settle the question of the truth or, or, or otherwise of those religious beliefs. That said, Bloom, who is a religious skeptic himself, um, thinks that um, the cognitive science of religion supports a really religiously skeptical stance because although it can't um it can't demonstrate that um religious belief is false um according to bloom um csr can show that religious beliefs are epistemically unreliable because the cognitive mechanisms that generate those beliefs are not reliably um, tied to the the um, realities of the world, you know, to to, to um, empirical and, and demonstrable reality. Um, so Bloom thinks that although um, although CSR and and um, by extension the neuroscience of religion can't disprove religious belief, they can undermine it. They they can help to discredit it. Um, Justin Barrett and Ian Church would very much disagree with that. And, and Barrett has, has argued in, in many publications that, um, uh, that the cognitive science of religion can actually um, support um, religious belief and, um, and can, can um, form the basis uh, for, for a certain kind of religious apologetic. So, um, should Christians learn from neuro neuroscience or cognitive science of religion that they need to abandon their faith? Well, probably not, but there's an ongoing argument about whether, um, whether CSR and the neuroscience of religion tend to support or possibly, um, possibly tend to undermine religious belief.
what then should Christians learn from neuroscience or cognitive science of religion? Um, another possible answer to that question might be nothing at all. Um, Christian believers and, and theologians might conclude that the right way to respond to these fields of research is simply to ignore them, either because they consider the, the, the research itself so flawed or wrong-headed that it doesn't deserve to be taken seriously, or they might um, take the view that um, the research may be perfectly sound in its own right, but it's simply irrelevant to Christian belief and theology. Um, and there may be some reasons for, for questioning its, its relevance. We could go into that further in the discussion if we have time and, and, and you're interested. Um, uh, in the end, my own view is that that would be the wrong conclusion to draw, um, but it's a conclusion that, that one could defend. As far as the research being flawed or, or, or wrong-headed or, or just mistaken is concerned, um, it's, um, um, research in both of these fields is certainly open to criticism, and there's, um, there's a fair amount of criticism um, uh, even from, from within those, those research fields um, themselves. Um, by researchers in those fields of research, some of the research that's done in those fields. But that doesn't mean this science is fatally flawed and should just be rejected on, on, on those grounds. So should Christians um, accept the research and abandon their faith? I'd say not. Should Christians ignore the research? Again, I'd say not. There is a third possibility, which is that the neuroscience and cognitive science of religion might generate insights that in some way, maybe a limited way, but, but maybe still a significant way, can inform faith and theology. So for example, um, if the cognitive scientists of religion um, are correct in, um, in the, um, the, 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 the theories and claims that, um, that they've developed, about the cognitive mechanisms that naturally in human beings tend to generate religious belief, um, that may give us insights into um, the kind of natural tendency that human beings have to, um, to form religious beliefs and the kinds of beliefs that they are naturally inclined to form. And of course, the kinds of beliefs that we're naturally predisposed to may or may not stack up so well with the, um, the, with, with the tenets of Christian faith, with the Christian doctrines that, 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 that Christian believers are, are um, theoretically committed to, that Christian believers would take to be, um, uh, in some way or other, um, uh, a, a matter of revelation. Um, or, or, or things that, that, that's, that, that we learn from Revelation. So there might be a mismatch between the kinds of belief we're, we're, we're naturally inclined to and the kinds of belief that, um, that Christian faith commits us to or calls us to. So um, some years ago, Justin Barrett, and then a bit later, Jason Sloan started talking about theological correctness and theological incorrectness to describe this, this, this sort of mismatch that, that, that um, uh, CSR might um, might give us insights into. Um, more recently, Jonathan Young and his his, his co-authors um, uh, uh, kind of half, um, at least half seriously, relabeled the cognitive science of religion as the cognitive science of idolatry. Um, uh, again, picking up this idea that 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 um, the cognitive science of religion might give us insights into the kinds of distortions in, in belief that we're naturally uh, inclined to or, 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 or predisposed to. And among other things, this, this, could, be, um, this could prove quite salutary for, for Christian theologians whose, um, whose business it is to try and think through um, the, 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 the commitments of Christian faith as clearly and coherently as, and, and, and rigorously as they can. Um, theologians are human beings like any other human being with the same kinds of um, brains and the same kinds of cognitive architecture and therefore presumably the same kinds of predispositions to, to either, um, uh, either true or distorted forms of belief as, as, as any other human beings. So insight into 
um, our own cognitive biases and the ways they might distort our theological labors could be quite salutary for us theologians, um, as well as giving insights into uh, that, that, that could, for example, be, be, be helpful in, in, um, in pastoral care and in Christian education, as, as, as Justin Barrett suggests. So that would be one kind of um, possibility for what Christian um, believers and theologians might be able to learn from these um, the, 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 these these fields of, of scientific investigation into religious belief. More positively, um, if if that's all about distortions and 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 and, and um, exposing and critiquing distorted forms of belief, more positively. Um, uh, a suggestion that that I've played around with a little bit in, in something I, I, I wrote in a paper I wrote fairly recently um, is that uh, natural forms of religious belief to which humans might be predisposed, if, if um, uh, CSR scholars are correct, those natural forms of religious belief um, could be um, taken up and used by God, by God's grace, as a means of divine revelation. The, um, the thought there is building on um, the thinking of the great 20th century Protestant theologian Karl Barth um, and, and his theological critique of religion, um, religion as, as a, um, a human activity or, or, or a human attempt to um, reach out to God and know God. I mean, Barth... Um, uh, Bart was first and last a theologian of revelation who um, who insisted that we can only know God insofar as God reveals God's self to us. Um, uh, and, and one of his sound bites about uh, about religion as, as human activity, what was was religion is unbelief, um, uh, by which he meant that as um, as as a human attempt to discover God for ourselves rather than receiving God's self-disclosure to us, um, uh, the, the, the human project of religion is, 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 is bound to be a, a, a kind of idolatrous and, and doomed project. And yet, Bart, Bart is also willing to say that all kinds of human experience and, 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 and all kinds of, of, of you know, um, things and phenomena in the world can be taken up by God and used as means of revelation. Um, uh, and commentators on Bart, like Joshua Ralston, have pushed that thought um, a bit further on, um, uh, e even than Bart did, to say, well, well, it's it's quite thinkable that that natural um, human religiosity um, isn't in its own right going to. Um, enable us to, 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 to reach God. Only God can reach us, if you like, but maybe God can um, take up and use these natural religious dispositions and, and, and inclinations um, that are part of, yeah, that are wired into our, 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 um, our brains and cognitive architecture uh, to, to use those as a means of God's self-disclosure to humanity. So there are all kinds of ways, um, I would suggest, that the neuroscience and cognitive science of religion can inform faith and theology. Um, there are reasons to engage, yes, cautiously, yes, critically with these areas of scientific research, but to en engage um, openly and constructively as well. So that's... Um, that brings me to the end of the first part of the talk, um, uh, asking what, if anything, well, well, what theologians and Christian believers should make of the neuroscientific and cognitive scientific study of um, religious belief. Moving on now to the um, to the other part of this interaction that I, I, I sketched out at the beginning, um, the 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 interaction between neuroscience and ethics and Christian theology. Um, moving now into the territory of neuroethics, and in particular this, um, uh, this topic that I mentioned at the opening, um, in, in the opening of my talk, um, the topic, the, the, this, this um, area of work that's often known as brain reading. 
What do we mean by brain reading? Well, what's meant by this is the use of functional brain imaging techniques like electroencephalography, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, to gain information about um, the, the mental states and the thoughts of, um, of human individuals, of, of, of subjects. So the assumption here, the, the, the basic working assumption, which is a very big assumption actually, um, is that every thought we have, um, every thought we have or every mental state that we experience corresponds to um, a particular state of brain activity or a particular kind of brain activity or a particular state of our brains that would in principle be detectable by functional imaging. Um, I've said that's a big assumption. Um, it would be contested by, 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 by some commentators. Um, and this field of brain reading that, 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 that rests on this assumption is beset with a whole, um, whole set of other um, conceptual issues, concept, perhaps conceptual problems, and also uh, formidable technical challenges. But that hasn't stopped many neuroscientists attempting to use functional brain imaging um, techniques to gain information about, um, about people's um, mental states and thoughts uh, to, to attempt this activity known as brain reading. So what might it be used for? Well, there's a whole range of applications um, uh, that this technology can be used for. Um, I've just listed three on this slide. Um, the first is often referred to as the detection of covert awareness in patients with disorders of consciousness, such as those who are in a vegetative state. So if, um, if someone suffers severe brain damage um, for, for some reason, um, uh, uh, for example, um, due to a traumatic injury or a stroke or something like that, um, they may... Um, they may suffer what's known as a disorder of consciousness. And the most severe of these has, has been known for many years as the vegetative state. This is a state in which um, uh, a patient's brain can, um, uh, uh, can still sustain um, basic vital functions like um, uh, respiration and circulation and so on. The patient will go through cycles of sleep and wakefulness, but they will show no signs of any um, conscious awareness. They'll show, show no signs of any consciousness, no, no signs of any conscious awareness of what's going on around them, no capacity um, to interact with the world around them or with, with, with people around them in any way. And if that state persists for long enough, um, it's uh, uh, clinically um, judged to be permanent with, with um, effectively no hope of recovery. So a few years ago, the neuroscientist Adrian Owen, who, who you can see on the slide there, um, started investigating um, the, um, the vegetative state um, neuroscientifically. Um, neurologically using functional um, brain imaging, using fMRI. And he discovered that um, some, not, not all, um, a minority, but some of the patients that he studied um, using fMRI, um, who had PVS diagnoses, who, who were clinically judged to have no, no conscious awareness and no capacity for consciousness at all. Some of these patients, um, Owen found, were able to perform mental tasks that could be detected by fMRI. So if he asked these patients to imagine that they were playing tennis, a certain area of their brains would light up, which was um, which pretty much corresponded to the areas of the brain that would light up if he asked healthy people, healthy volunteers to, to perform the same mental task. If he asked these patients to imagine walking around their house, different areas of the brain would light up, again, corresponding to, to what you'd see in, 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 um, in, in healthy people. Um, and Owen was even able to use these, this, the performance of these mental tasks to communicate with these patients, patients who, who outwardly couldn't communicate at all, 
and showed no no responsiveness or signs of consciousness. Um, he was able to use the, the, um, the, these um, these mental tasks to communicate with these patients by asking yes or no questions and asking them to perform different mental tasks depending on whether the answer was yes or no. So this is one use of this technology, the detection of covert awareness and even establishing some form of communication with some patients um, who are diagnosed as being in a permanent vegetative state. The second application of brain reading um, that I want to mention is very different. Um, it's known as neuromarketing. And basically this relies on the, the insight that um, uh, consumers purchasing behavior is driven much more by their emotions than their, their um, reasoned decision-making. And what neuromarketing involves is using um, brain imaging techniques to gain information about people's responses to advertising and marketing materials. And to use that information to design advertising and marketing that is fine tuned to push our emotional buttons as effectively as possible to induce us to buy more of the stuff that the marketers are trying to sell us. That's neuromarketing. And the third application of, of brain reading um, technologies is neuroscience-based lie detection. Essentially, um, uh, trying to, um, uh, to establish whether, um, to establish from the pattern of someone's brain activity, whether they are telling you the truth or whether they're lying uh, when you ask them, um, uh, ask them the questions you're interested in, in, in having answers to. So um, the, the, um, the premise basically here is that there, um, there are different patterns of brain activity associated with lying from those associated with truth telling. And if you can identify what those are, you can use those to, to, um, you know, to detect more effectively than, 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 than other techniques can, whether someone is lying or telling you the truth. And the most obvious application of this um, uh, of course, is in law enforcement, in, in, in policing and criminal justice and so on. But this neuroscience based lie detection technology has also been promoted for use in employment to enable employers to find out things about their employees that their employees may not wish to disclose. And it's even been promoted for use in personal relationships. Is your spouse or your partner cheating on you? Well, put them in a scanner and ask them. So three divergent applications of brain reading technology. But what about the ethics of all this? Um, is, is, is all this ethically um, legitimate? Um, does this raise any ethical concerns? Maybe the most obvious ethical concern that it raises is um, about privacy, mental privacy. I think most of us, I'd guess, would have a fairly deep-seated in intuition that what goes on inside our heads is a particularly private sphere of our lives. Um, it's what goes on in our minds is private to us, except insofar as we choose to disclose it to others. And I'm, I guess that many people would, would think that matters. And therefore, um, technologies that um, seem to, to offer the prospect of intruding on that private private realm of, of, of our own minds and thoughts, these technologies may, um, may, may offer um, uh, some cause for ethical concern. But how to think through the, the ethics of this, how to, how to think through whether this, actually, um, whether this actually could ever be an ethically justified activity, and if so, under what circumstances, for what purposes? Well, the philosopher Mark Tunick has, has unpicked the notion of, of privacy, including mental privacy, um, in a little more uh, detail. And he's identified um, various, various different aspects of what we call privacy. Um, perhaps most obviously, there's what he calls informational privacy. Privacy, privacy in, in one sense, is about who has access to what information about us. What kinds of information about ourselves do we wish to keep private? What information are we happy to, to disclose uh, to others or make public? 
But Tunic also identifies other, other aspects or, or, or areas of privacy. Um, what he refers to as decisional privacy, the ability to make and act on our own significant decisions. And what he calls local privacy, um, the, 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 the kind of privacy that has to do with private spaces or private spheres. If my, my room or my um, apartment or house is, is a, a private area, um, it's an area that I occupy and others only enter at my inv invitation. That, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that Tunic means by local privacy. And these different aspects of privacy, he says, matters. We have an interest in these aspects of privacy um, because in one way or another, they all safeguard our autonomy, our, our ability to, 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 to um, uh, make and act on our, our own decisions. And they also safeguard our human dignity. Um, if people's privacy is infringed, then um, in some way their dignity has been, um, has been undermined or threatened. Um, think of um, a, a, you know, a, a public figure whose you know, um, intimate private life is splashed all over the news media. We feel they've suffered a loss of dignity in, 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 in some way. So we have an interest in privacy. It matters to us. Does that interest in privacy amount to a right? Well, it can do, if it outweighs others' interests in infringing that privacy. Um, it may be, for example, that in, in, in some situations, the criminal justice system has, has an interest in, in um, finding out things about my activities that I would rather other people didn't find out. Um, there's a legitimate public interest in, in, um, in, in that kind of infringement of, 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 um, of someone's privacy. But, um, Unless there's some competing interest of others, other individuals or society, then the interest I have in my own privacy can be counted as a right to privacy. That's Mark Tunick's philosophical account of the ethics of privacy. And it's, it's easy to see how that could apply to um, the, the, um, the applications of brain reading that I just covered on the last slide. However, if we're trying to think about all this as Christian believers, is Tunic's philosophical account going to be quite sufficient for us? Christian believers um, are accustomed to the thought that um, God knows our innermost thoughts through and through. Um, we're accustomed to the to the to, to the idea that we don't have any mental privacy to speak of from God. Um, I've quoted on the slides two well-known biblical texts, the text from Psalm 139 about God discerning our thoughts from far away, and the, that, um, the, the, you know, the Pauline text from the letter to the Romans about God judging the secret thoughts of all. In the light of biblical texts like these, do we really have any stake as Christians in the idea of mental privacy? If we're accustomed to the idea that God knows our thoughts through and through, is it such a big deal if, if other human beings can find out information about our thoughts? Do Christians have to think any differently about the ethics of brain reading from the kind of um, philosophical um, approach that Tunic um, uh, offers that I just summarized earlier? Well, if we're to um, to answer this question theologically, I think we need to ask um, a little bit more about what we mean, what we understand by God's knowledge of us. And the theologian Rachel Muirs argues that um, divine knowledge um, is not simply um, not simply the same as human knowledge the way we often conceive it on a bigger scale. Or, or a more powerful or more complete scale. Divine knowledge um, in particular is not simply possession of information, divine knowledge of us, God's knowledge of us, is not simply possession of information about us. Rather, Muirs argues, um, God's knowledge of us must be understood as what she calls hearing knowledge. And she derives that phrase from the, the, the narrative at the beginning of the book of Exodus, where God tells Moses that you know, God has heard the cry of the people of Israel and has come down to deliver them. So Muir says, 
if we're, if we're thinking about God's knowledge of humanity, we must think of, of God's knowledge as inseparable from God's judgment, God's love, God's commitment to humanity, God's action on behalf of human beings. Very often when we think about the human activity of brain reading, we're thinking of a scientific um, practice that basically attempts to gain knowledge about what's going on inside other people's heads. It's not the kind of knowledge gathering activity that, uh, that seems to reflect these divine qualities of love and commitment, relationship and committed action. And that means, that suggests that even if we're quite comfortable with, with the, the idea that God knows our thoughts through and through, that doesn't necessarily mean we should be so comfortable with the human activity of gathering knowledge about our or other people's thoughts. This human activity of um, gaining information about others' thoughts may not be so benign. It may, be, uh, may not be unproblematic. And in order to safeguard ourselves and one another against the potential abuses of this, um, this human practice of, of knowledge gathering, um, privacy may still be an important safeguard. But uh, for all that, Tunic's rights-based account of privacy may not um, get us as far as we need to get with this. It may not be a fully satisfactory account of, of uh, what we should mean or understand by privacy from a Christian theological perspective. Maybe we need a richer and fuller account of mental privacy in response to the ethics of brain reading. And in something I wrote about this um, a, a couple of years ago, I suggested that um, a good starting point to think theologically about the ethics of privacy in relation to brain reading is to ask, well, what practices of knowledge and self-disclosure might be conducive to our flourishing as human creatures in relation to God, in relation to one another, in relation to our fellow creatures? Uh, what practices of knowledge and self-disclosure might make for our human creaturely flourishing? And how do these various applications of brain reading measure up to that kind of criterion? So to conclude, um, I've suggested, and I would want to suggest, that Christian believers and theologians have good reasons to engage critically and constructively with neuroscience uh, and also with, with, with cognitive science in, in, in a whole range of ways. The neuroscientific and cognitive scientific study of religion may um, in, in some ways inform Christian faith and Christian theology. It may have, um, uh, albeit limited, but nonetheless valuable things, insights to offer to Christian believers and theologians. Christian ethics has valuable resources for addressing some pressing and emerging neuroethical issues. So I'll finish up there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for, for engaging with, with what I've had to say. And um, I'd be very happy to engage in some discussion um, of any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you very much for a very great uh, presentation, insightful, um, provocative in terms of some of the questions we, we may not normally have um, asked ourselves. I want to start off with a question that draws on your molecular biology background. Um, mm -hmm. is, uh, are there studies, research out there now looking at biomolecules and how they may or may not be able to measure something like spirituality and spiritual experiences. So I'm thinking specifically of things like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, those types of molecules. Um, are there, is there research going on that tries to make that connection between spirituality and those specific types of molecules? Mm, thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, um, I, 
I'm not aware of any, but that that certainly doesn't mean to say there isn't any. Um, I think um, my my impression is that neuroscientific studies of of religion tend to operate more at the the level of of functional neuroimaging um, and and and, <clears throat> and um, mostly at the level of, of, of trying to identify um, regions of the brain that might be active mm -hmm. um, in, 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 um, in, in various you know, various forms of, of, of religious practice or experience. Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, whether um, whether or how much um, people are, are sort of drilling down to investigate neurotransmitter you know, levels right. or, 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 um, uh, uh, or how, how, how those might be correlated with, with, with um, different religious experiences. Um, uh, as I say, as, as not, not to say that research isn't going on, um, mm -hmm. but um, um, but my 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 sense of the um the the the, the neuroscientific work that's been done up to now um is is that it's 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 most mostly focused on 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 functional imaging rather than rather than the kind of biomolecular um okay. study that you're, you're you're talking about. So that's a wide open area of study and research. Then mm. seems to... potentially yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Other other comments questions. I see Anthony. Anthony, you could unmute. There you go. Yeah, yeah, thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, I'm curious your thoughts of, would you say that um, our current understanding of neuroscience has any bearing on the question of theological determinism or theological fatalism? So questions of free will and um, theological reflections on that. Um, or does Can the neuroscience inform this discussion at all? Um, great question. I, um... I think it can. Um, it, it needs some cautious handling. So, so, so um, um, some people will argue that that, um, uh, that, that neuroscience, at least in, indirectly, um, uh, supports a hard determinist position where where um, all our, our our thoughts, decisions, and actions are completely ca causally determined, um, and we don't have free will. Um, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm, several years ago, the the, the, um, uh, the the neuroscientists Joshua Green and Jonathan Cohen um, uh, wrote a famous article um, entitled "For the Law: Neuroscience Changes Nothing and Everything," where they they argued that um, uh, neuroscience didn't have any direct bearing on philosophical arguments about um, determinism and, and, and free will, but um, in, as it were, in trying to sell those arguments, uh, and, and particularly to, you know, to try and sell the hard, de hard determinist position that they wanted to advocate, neuroscience um, had a, um, uh, had a helpful role from their point of view in, 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 in um, making hard determinism seem more intuitively plausible because um, it, it made the workings of the brain more transparent and therefore made it, um, um, made it more transparent what was going on in the brain uh, as um, uh, you know, thoughts, decisions, intentions, and so on are forming. Um, that, that was their argument. I, I mean, I, 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 I um, personally find that rather unconvincing. Um, I mean, it, um, but, but, but some, some will argue in, in, in that way. Um, um, my own view is if we're trying to think about this theologically, um, what what should we what should we make of, of um, yeah, the, the kind of in yeah you know, the kind of indirect in, in indication that, that, that people like Green and Cohen are advocating, or, 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 or what, what should we make more more generally of of, of the you know, um, the whole range of discussions about uh, neuroscience, determinism, and free will. Um, 
and I'd want to say various things. First of all, that um, that Christian theologians have have good reasons to um, um, well let's say Christian theologians have, have, have good reasons to to, to, um, to think that a compatibilist position is is is, um, is, is perfectly viable um, um, so uh yeah how, how to put this um so a um a physicalist understanding of brain and mind um doesn't entail um, a, a, a completely uh, causally reductionist uh, view of um, the brain and mental causation. I mean, that, 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 uh, that, that's an argument that Nancy Murphy made, um, 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 well, has made for many years. Um, so, so Christians are quite entitled to think that there, there, there's 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 enough conceptual space within this field, as it, as it were, to to to, um, um, to maintain a compatibilist uh, understanding of determinism and free will, to 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 to, to believe that you know, or, or, or to maintain that that um, causal determination um, of mental processes is compatible with, with genuine free will. Um, I think if if Christians are then going to bring a a, 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 a theological tradition to bear on this, um, they can also reframe um, standard debates about determinism, free will, and uh, moral responsibility in quite helpful ways on on the strength of um, the Christian tradition's understanding of of sin and grace, for example. So, 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 one of the the, the, you know, the, 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 the questions that 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 debates about determinism and free will throw up that that that, um, uh, that, that sometimes gets a bit tangled um, uh, is is whether um, uh, whether and to what extent we can be held morally responsible for. Um, Actions that are causally determined, hmm. and 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 there's I mean, I, the, the, um, there's two dimensions to that to that that question. I mean, I mean, I mean one is about the, the yeah the, the kind of strict yeah strict debates about compatibilism and and, and compatibilism versus hard determinism, um, but but alongside the, the, those debates, there, there are also neuroscientific um, claims that we may have less freedom of of, of decision and action than we like to think. That, that, that to some extent our, our sense of, of, of free will may be illusory. Um, if that's the case, does that um, diminish our moral responsibility for our actions? Well, if you, um, um, if you reinterpret that debate through the lens of um, you know, the, um, the kind of tradition of thinking about sin and grace that, 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 that begins with, with Augustine of Hippo, um, then um, it becomes possible to to speak of um, sin, guilt, responsibility uh, in a, in a way that um, um, in a way that means um, we can be. In some sense, accountable for aspects of our life or our actions that are not completely under our control. Mm. That's what the Augustinian tradition, um, in effect, says about 
sin and why we need God's grace. Um, and that, I would want to say, can can quite helpfully reflect, reframe some, you know, um, uh, what are sometimes rather tangled kind of debates about um, uh, um, physical cause and effect, um, moral agent and and moral responsibility or the lack of it. Mm -hmm. so I, I hope that made some sense. That's um, very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's um, a lot of a lot of thought um, is needed uh, in terms of the nuances of what you know neuroscience is presenting to us. I think the advantage, the benefit, is that it makes us think, think through assumptions that you know we've uh, thought about. Not. Not that we may come to a different conclusion, but we think them through more deeply. And that's a good exercise. All right. So we want to thank you again so much for your presentation. And um, we hope that, well, I don't know if you're going to be on spring break. I don't know if that applies there, but um, for, for the rest of us here, Hope everyone has a good spring break and see you guys um, next time. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.